also about creep and chariot wheels. And here I want to tell you a story about a ship that was made during the war. She was a steamer, and she was built of wood, good wood, and the men who designed her were good and able craftsmen too. She went along like a man who carries too heavy a burden, and presently she tripped and stumbled, it was only a little ground swell. And she opened out and fell apart like a flimsy old crate that someone had stepped on. In five minutes there was nothing there at all except a floating scum of coal dust, with some timbers and an odd man or two bobbing about in the middle of it. This is a true story, but the point I want you to notice is that this ship was made by carpenters, house carpenters, shore carpenters, and she was not built by shipwrights at all. Weston Martyr, the South Seaman The steamer in Weston Martyr's story sank, rather suddenly, because the joints which were supposed to hold her timbers together were much too weak. Although the house carpenters who built her, who were honest men in their own way, were presumably satisfied with them. In fact, when a shore carpenter is building a house or putting together traditional furniture he is in the habit of making joints which a naval architect or an engineer would regard as weak and highly inefficient. Weak these joints certainly are, whether they are inefficient depends upon what one is trying to do. The purposes of a builder of houses may not be at all the same as those of a builder of ships or aeroplanes. It is perhaps too often assumed by engineers that an efficient structure is always one in which each component and each joint is exactly strong enough for the loads which it has to bear, so that, for a given strength, the smallest amount of material is used and the weight is minimized. Such a structure would, ideally, be equally likely to break anywhere. Or indeed, like the one Hoshe it might break everywhere at once. To work towards this kind of efficiency calls for great vigilance on the part of the engineer, since the least fault in design or manufacture must introduce a dangerous weakness. Approximations to this kind of structure do, of course, exist, especially in ships and aeroplanes and in some kinds of machinery where weight saving is very important. However, this represents an unduly specialized way of looking at the problem of efficiency, and it takes no account of the need for rigidity, let alone of the need for economy. Structures of the one Hoshe type are sometimes necessary, but they are always expensive both to build and to maintain. Weight saving by means of Builders and joiners have more sense than to go in for fancy structures of this kind, houses are quite expensive enough as it is. And these people know very well that in the great majority of the common or stationary affairs of life the design of a structure is influenced much more by its stiffness than by its strength. Indeed it is the relative importance of the need for strength and for stiffness which really lies at the root of the question of the cost and efficiency of structures. Where the need is chiefly for rigidity rather than strength, the whole problem becomes very much easier and cheaper. This is nearly always the case with furniture and floors and staircases and buildings generally, and also with cookers and refrigerators and with many tools and heavy machinery and with some of the parts of motor cars. These things do not very often break, but, if we made the material much thinner, the deflections and bendiness and general wobbliness would soon become unacceptable. Thus, to be rigid enough, the various parts generally have to be so thick that the stresses in them are very low, often, from the engineer's point of view, absurdly so. It follows that, in structures of this kind, even if the material is riddled with defects and stress concentrations, it probably does not matter very much, and, what is more, the strength of the joints is unlikely to be critical, in many cases. A few nails may be perfectly adequate. This sort of thing is, of course, the basis of most people's instinctive approach to design. Millions of people who have never heard of Hooke's Law or Young's Modulus can guess the stiffness of a table or a chicken coop quite nearly enough by experience and common sense, and, if such things are made stiff enough, they are very unlikely to break under their ordinary, everyday loads. Furthermore, a little bit of give in some of the joints may be no disadvantage, 
and this is more likely to be available in a traditional joint than in a sophisticated one. For one thing a certain amount of flexibility may enable the loads to be evened out in a beneficial way. Although it is true that furniture does not very often get broken, quite a good way of attempting to do so is to sit on a chair, three of whose legs are on the carpet while the fourth rests, hopefully, on the bare floor. With traditional furniture the load may be spread over all the four legs by the distortion of the tenon joints, in modern factory made chairs with efficient glue joints, these joints may just break. After which the chair is difficult to repair in any satisfactory way. Another reason for encouraging a certain amount of flexibility in joints is that wood, and sometimes other materials, change their dimensions with the weather. Wood shrinks and swells in the cross grain direction by up to 5 or even 10 per center traditional joinery allows for this by means of inefficient slotted joints. In Churchill College we had a fine new high table made from the best and most expensive wood, which had been scientifically glued together with strong, rigid joints. After a few months in the scientifically heated hall, this table shrank and split down the middle. The result was not an unobtrusive little crack but a crevasse many yards long and quite capable of providing sheltered accommodation for large numbers of peas of normal or standard diameter. Many deflection-controlled peasant structures are wholly excellent in their proper places but when we come to demand weight saving and strength and mobility we may get into all sorts of difficulties. Especially in relation to the reliability of the joints between the various parts. Historically, this has always been the most serious problem in ship construction and in windmills and water mills. The great skill of the old shipwrights and millwrights lay in somehow combining sufficient strength for safety with the modicum of flexibility needed to allow for the working of timber. The older shipwrights erred on the side of flexibility, and, though their ships were often excessively leaky, they seldom actually broke at sea. It required the administrative abilities of modern wartime governments to produce wooden ships which really did fall to pieces. Troubles with joints in ships and aircraft were a fairly prominent feature of both the world wars. During the first war the Americans built a large number of wooden ships, both steam and sail, frequently by unorthodox methods, and many of these ships broke up. In the second war they produced even greater numbers of welded steel steamers, of which an even higher proportion broke, either at sea or in harbor. In England, in both wars, we manufactured very large quantities of wooden aircraft, which always seemed to be having joint troubles of one kind or another. As far as aircraft are concerned this was not wholly surprising, for I remember being shown, right inside vital glue joints in the main structure, on various separate occasions. One a pair of scissors. Two a first aid manual, pocket size, three. No glue at all. On the whole I do not think that most of these accidents were caused by subnormal or abnormal people, I am afraid the guilt generally lay with very ordinary people, and that was just the trouble. Naturally, people get tired or bored, but I think the root of the matter was much deeper than that. Very few of those who made, or failed to make, these joints had any personal experience of a situation in which the failure of a joint could cause a fatal accident. Though collectively they had a great deal of experience of things like cupboards and garden sheds, where the strength of the joints really mattered very little. All our efforts to persuade them that a badly made joint was morally equivalent to manslaughter foundered on a deeply held folk tradition that it was silly to fuss about such things and that strength is a boring subject anyway. All this would not have mattered so much if it had not been practically impossible to inspect the joints properly after they were made. In more recent years very efficient metal-to-metal -metal adhesives have been developed which have a number of solid technical advantages, always provided that the joints are really conscientiously made. Unfortunately, their use in modern aircraft has been handicapped by the fact that it has proved necessary to provide a separate inspector to watch each worker throughout the gluing operation. Also inspectors to inspect the inspectors. Rather naturally, these arrangements have proved expensive. In spite of all this,
I am told that the use of glue in modern metal aircraft is increasing. Since the function of a joint is to transmit load from one element of a structure to its neighbor, stress has somehow got to get itself out of one piece of material and then get itself into the adjoining piece. Such a process is only too likely to result in severe concentrations of stress and consequent weakness. All the same, in a few favorable circumstances it may be possible to arrange for the stress to pass uniformly across the joint from one component to the other with little or no concentration of stress. This is more or less the case with a glued scarf joint in timber, figure 1, and a butt weld in metal. Figure 2. Figure 1. Glued scarf joint in timber. Figure 2. Butt weld in metal. However, it is by no means always practicable to use scarfed or butt welded joints, and some form of lap joint between two adjacent planks or plates is probably more common. This sort of geometry at once introduces stress concentrations, and as far as a rigid lap joint is concerned it does not make much difference whether the joint is glued, nailed, screwed, welded, bolted or riveted. In all cases most of the load is transferred at the two ends of the joint, figure 3. Figure 3. Load transfer in a lap joint. For this reason the strength of such joints depends largely upon their width and very little upon the length of the overlap between the parts. This is why the simplest and commonest forms of riveted and welded joints between two metal plates, figures 4 and 5, are reasonably effective and not much improved by complicating them. Figure 4. Riveted lap joint. Figure 5. Welded lap joint. Very often we want to provide an end attachment for a tension bar or rod to some kind of socket or solid anchorage, again much the same considerations apply, except that in this case there is only one stress concentration, which usually occurs at the point where the rod enters its socket, figure 6. If the rod is screwed into its anchorage, for instance, nearly all of the load is taken out by the first two or three threads, and any extra length of rod within the socket will do little or no good. Thus the difficulty which a thrush has in pulling a worm out of a lawn does not depend on the length of the worm, a short worm is just as hard to extract as a long one asterisk. Figure 6 The distribution of stress which is shown in Figure 6 applies when the two components of the joint have similar Young's moduli, which is usually the case with metal-to-metal -metal joints. It also applies when the rod or tension bar is less stiff than the material of its socket or anchorage, which appears to be the case with worms and lawns. If the rod or bar is substantially stiffer than the material into which one is trying to anchor it, however, the stress situation may be reversed and the stress concentration may exist mainly at the bottom or inner end of the rod or insert, figure 7. In practice, of course, both situations are likely to weaken the joint about equally. There may exist, perhaps, a ratio between the modulus of the insert and that of its surroundings which would give an optimum distribution of stress in the joint, but, if there is such a ratio, it is very difficult to hit it off in. Wire cables With frayed out ends, like the roots of a tree, into the body of the plastic, when specimens of this ill-conceived construction were loaded in a testing machine, the wires pulled out of the plastic with a succession of cracking noises and at ridiculously low loads. Figure 7. Load transfer in embedded rods under tension. In the next experiment sword-like tapered steel blades or prongs were substituted for the cables and were molded into the plastic wing structure after being coated with a suitable adhesive. Figure 8. This time the test specimen failed, not with a series of cracking noises, but with one loud bang, but still at just as low a load. Figure 8. The wrong shape for a steel insert. This arrangement is weak. After a pause for reflection and intelligent thought about worms, we tried out a series of wide spade-shaped steel inserts which were much shorter and looked something like figure 9. All these failed at far higher loads which were, in each case, proportional to the breadth of the spade.
By developing this design we were able to take out loads in the region of 40 to 50 tons from plastic structures by means of quite a small steel fitting. Figure 9. The right shape for a steel insert. This is much stronger. Such joints depend entirely upon the adhesion between the metal and the plastic and must therefore be molded conscientiously and under suitable inspection. They must also be designed with care, because, in all such cases, adhesion between a metal and a non-metal will fail completely as soon as the metal reaches its yield point and ceases to behave elastically. Asterisk since the stresses in the metal are much higher than one might expect, it is generally necessary to make the insert from high tensile steel, carefully heat treated. Furthermore the trailing edge of the steel insert must be ground sharp, like a chisel. I've got one fraction of an inch of play, at any rate, said the garb board strake, triumphantly. So he had, and all the bottom of the ship felt easier for it. Then we're no good, sobbed the bottom rivets. We were ordered we were ordered, never to give. And we've given, and the sea will come in, and we'll all go to the bottom together. First we're blamed for everything unpleasant, and now we haven't the consolation of having done our work. Don't say I told you, whispered the steam, consolingly, but, between you and me and the last cloud I came from, it was bound to happen sooner or later. You had to give a fraction, and you've given without knowing it. Now hold on, as before. Rudyard Kipling, the ship that found herself. Riveted joints in steel structures are rather out of fashion, chiefly because they are expensive but partly because they tend to be heavier than welded joints. This is a pity, because riveted joints have several advantages. A riveted joint is reliable and easy to inspect, and in a large structure it acts to some extent as a crack stopper, that is to say, if a really large and healthy Griffith crack gets underway, it may quite often, though not infallibly be stopped or delayed by the moat or discontinuity of a riveted joint. Even more importantly, riveted joints can slip a little and so redistribute the load, thus evading the consequences of the stress concentrations which are the bane of all joints. The process has been described for all time in the ship that found herself, and indeed Kipling's feeling for the problems of stress concentrations and cracks in structures, many years before Inglis and Griffith, is very remarkable. Some of his stories about structures might well be required reading for engineering students. Because each individual rivet can slip very slightly, the worst effects of stress concentrations may be reduced, and so it may be worthwhile to make lap joints having several rivets in series. Since the end rivets may be able to slip enough to enable those in the middle to do some work, when a newly made riveted joint between steel or iron plates has settled itself into a reasonable distribution of load, then rust may have a chance to play its beneficent part. The products of corrosion, iron oxides, and hydroxides, expand and so lock the joint and prevent it from sliding backwards and forwards when the load is reversed. Furthermore, the rust transmits some of the shearing forces between the plates, rather like a glue, and therefore the strength of a riveted lap joint generally increases with age. Figure 10. Three of the ways in which a riveted joint may fail. A. Failure by shearing the rivets. B. Failure by tearing the rivets out of the plate, i.e. by bearing or elongation of the holes. C. Failure by tearing the plates. When rivet holes are made in large steel structures, such as ships and boilers, it is usual to punch them. Although this is a quick and cheap way of making holes in steel it is not entirely satisfactory, since the metal at the edge of the hole is left in a brittle condition and also often contains small cracks. Since there will certainly be stress concentrations in this region, this is not a good state of affairs. For this reason, in high-class work, it is usual to punch the holes undersize and then ream them. Although this adds to the expense, it also adds materially to the strength and reliability of the joint. Both riveted and bolted joints can be made in all sorts of different shapes and sizes but, broadly speaking, 
All such joints have a choice of three different ways of failing. Figure 10. A. By shearing. Doing a suitable calculation. However, rules for the design of riveted joints are laid down by organizations like Lloyd's and the Board of Trade, and these are to be found in nearly all the engineering handbooks. Welded joints of all kinds are very widely used in steel work today, mainly because welding is generally cheaper than riveting and also because there is some increase in strength and saving in weight. In ships, too, the absence of rivet heads below the water line reduces the resistance by a small amount. Most sophisticated welding is electric arc welding. In this process the welder holds a metal rod, the welding rod, in his right hand by means of an insulated clamp. With his left hand he generally holds a mask or screen, furnished with very dark glass, through which he can safely watch the arc, which he strikes and holds between the tip of the rod and the seam which he is making. At the usual 30 to 50 volts the arc is perhaps a quarter of an inch, 7 millimeters, long and results in the transference of metal from the end of the welding rod to a little pool of molten steel which the welder coaxes along the joint. The result is, or should be, a continuous run or leg of weld metal, about a quarter of an inch, 7 millimeters, wide, which solidifies and bridges the joint. If a greater thickness of weld is needed, then the run must be repeated as many times as may be necessary. If the weld has been properly made it is generally very strong and satisfactory, but any lack of skill or attention on the part of the welder is likely to result in defects, such as slag inclusions, which weaken the joint and are not readily seen by an inspector. It is also easy for a clumsy welder to overheat enough of the surrounding metal to cause serious distortions. This is especially the case where the work to be welded is heavy and thick. The welded engine seatings in the pocket battleship Graf Spee, for instance, gave serious trouble from this cause. In theory a welded joint in a tank or a ship should be completely watertight without further treatment, but this is seldom the case. In practice welded construction is likely to give more trouble than riveted work in this respect. A riveted lap joint is easily caulked by spreading the edges of the plates by means of a pneumatic chisel or caulking tool. This cannot be done with a welded joint, and the best way of dealing with the situation is to inject some kind of liquid sealing compound under pressure into the space between the two welds of a lap joint. All the same, I remember seeing much trouble in connection with the water testing of compartments in welded warships. Once upon a time I had the privilege of working for a few weeks as a riveter and also as a welder in one of the royal dockyards, and during this time I learned various things which I do not think are in the textbooks. Although closing a two-inch rivet in an armored deck with a pneumatic hammer is both hard and noisy work, it is also curiously interesting. And most forms of riveting seem to me to have at least some of the attraction of golf with the advantage of being more useful. A further sporting element was added by the operation of the inspection process, in those days we were paid at the rate of so much for every rivet closed. But five times so much was deducted for every rivet which was condemned by the inspector and had to be drilled out and replaced. Riveting may not be heaven, but, by contrast, welding was certainly hell. Welding is amusing enough for the first hour or two as I dare say hell may very possibly be, but after this the task of watching a hissing, flickering arc, and a wretched little pool of molten metal becomes intolerably dull. And the dullness is not much relieved by the sparks and blobs of molten metal which find their way down one's neck and into one's shoes. After a very few days a feeling of boredom and bloody. Generally turns out to be very imperfect. Furthermore a welded joint provides little or no barrier to crack propagation, and this is one reason why so many large steel structures have failed catastrophically in recent years. Homer knew that the first thing to do on getting your chariot out was to put the wheels on. John Chadwick, The Decipherment of Linear B, Cambridge University Press, 1968 The chariots of Mycenaean and Archaic Greece had very light and flexible wheels, made from thin bent wood, willow or elm or cypress, usually with only four spokes, figure 11.
Such a construction was highly springy and resilient, and it seems to have enabled these vehicles to be galloped across the rough ground of the Greek hillsides, where a heavier and more rigid vehicle would have been useless. In fact, the rim of the wheel bent, rather like a bow, under the weight of the chariot, and, just as a bow must not be left strung for any length of time, so the weight must not be left on the wheels of a chariot. In the evening, therefore, one either tipped the vehicle vertically against a wall with the weight off the wheels, as Telemachus did in Book 4 of the Odyssey, or else one took the wheels off altogether. Even on Mount Olympus the goddess Hebe had the morning chore of fitting the wheels to the chariot of grey-eyed Athene. Heavier wheels of later times such a procedure is necessary and less practicable, although I understand that the wheels of the present Lord Mayor's coach are distinctly eccentric. Presumably because the weight has been left on them for long periods asterisk. Figure 11. The Homeric chariot wheel was essentially flexible and made by bending quite thin wood. It could easily distort or creep under any prolonged load. The distortion of bows and chariot wheels under prolonged loading is due to what the engineer calls creep. In elementary Hookean elasticity we assume, for simplicity, that if a material will sustain a stress at all, it will sustain it indefinitely, and also that the strains in a solid do not change with time. So long as the stress remains constant. In real materials neither of these assumptions is strictly true, nearly every substance will continue to extend or creep under a constant load with the baggy, it is, however much more pronounced in natural fibers, such as wool and cotton, than it is with the newer artificial fibers. This is why Terry lean sails not only keep their shape but do not need to be carefully stretched when new, as had to be done with cotton and flax sails. Figure 12. Typical time creep curves for a material subjected to a series of constant stresses, S, L, S, 2, S, 3, etc. Creep in metals is generally less pronounced than it is in non-metals, and, although steel creeps significantly at high stresses and when heated, the effect can often be neglected when one is dealing with light loads at ordinary temperatures. Creep in any material causes the stress to be redistributed in a manner which is often beneficial, since the more highly stressed parts creep the most. This is why old shoes are more comfortable than new ones. Thus the strength of a joint may improve with age if the stress concentrations are diminished. Naturally, if the load on the joint is reversed, creep may have the opposite effect and the joint may be weakened. The effect of the distortions caused by creep is particularly conspicuous in old wooden structures. In buildings the roof often sags in a picturesque way, and old wooden ships are generally hogged. The ends of the ship droop while the middle part rises. This is very noticeable in the gun decks of HMS Victory. With metals such as steel we generally notice the effects of creep when the springs of a car sit down and have to be replaced. Although the amount of creep which is likely to occur varies greatly between different solids, the general pattern of behavior is very much the same for nearly all materials. If we plot deformation or strain against the logarithm of time, which is a convenient way of contracting the time scale, for the 3. Time but will also gradually progress to actual fracture and destruction, an effect we generally wish to avoid. Soils, too, creep under load like other materials, and thus, unless we build upon rock or very hard ground, we need to watch the settlement of foundations, which will usually need to be deeper for large buildings than for small. This is the reason for constructing large buildings on concrete rafts. Note the subsidence of the foundations of the arches of Clare Bridge in Plate 7. Asterisk note that, if an undrawn nylon thread be cast into a block of rigid plastic, the thread can always be drawn out of the plastic by pulling on it, however long the thread may be. This is a good way of making long and complicated holes, for instance in wind tunnel models, for pressure measurements. Asterisk this is also true for the adhesion between metals and paint or enamel, including vitreous enamel I. 
e glass. Before the days of modern extensometers, engineers used to judge the yield point of hot rolled steel by the load at which the mill scale or black oxide film cracked off the surface. Asterisk this sort of thing is at the root of most of the stories about V.I.P.S being seasick when riding in state coaches. Or how to design a worm. I'm very glad, said Pooh happily, that I thought of giving you a useful pot to put things in. I'm very glad, said Piglet happily, that I thought of giving you something to put in a useful pot. A.A. Milne, Winnie the Pooh.